Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Easter to you on this most incredible time in all of our lives, perhaps the most incredible time in all of human history. Claire and I send you much love and light from Nashville and deep gratitude for joining us today for this moment. All of us are, are called upon at this moment while we celebrate Easter, while we celebrate the resurrection of Christ and all that means in our lives. We're now called upon to take another step forward and to begin to embody the most powerful force in the known universe, the compassion of the cosmic Christ. My goal today with you is to put you in touch with that deep part of yourself, that core part of yourself that has that endless reservoir of that compassion, light, and love, and to reset you for what is to come. I want to begin with our cover image. It's one of my favorite transfiguration icons of Jesus. It's from the 15th century. It's Russian. It illustrates the story of when after the baptism, Jesus takes several disciples, Peter, James, John, up to the top of a high mountain, and he transfigures before them. He literally turns into light. He changes his state of being from flesh and blood into a higher state, which we are assured by the mystics is our true nature, our original state. Jesus is demonstrating what is within all of us in his metamorphosis or transfiguration. His face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light, indicating this profound transformation that he's undergone. In the Psalms, it asks the question, who may ascend? the mountain of the Lord, this high mountain? Who may stand in his holy place? And the answer comes, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Well, now that we all have clean hands these days, thanks to our present world situation, it's time, I believe, to bring in the other half of this equation, a pure heart to open our hearts to ourselves and to one another, to all our loved ones, because indeed tapping this reservoir of compassion is going to be the only way that we are going to be victorious and triumphant in the days ahead. What we're called upon to do is to not only wash our hands, but to also wash our cloaks of light. This is how the Essenes would think of it. They were to wash their robes of light so that they could ascend into the celestial realms, the new Jerusalem or Sion. And one way that we begin to wash our robes of light is with acts of compassion. As Colossian says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This is what our times require, and it requires these acts of gentleness, compassion, kindness, and patience in order to weave our cloak of light. In addition to those acts of kindness, another way that we can begin to wash our robe and to embody the compassionate light and love of Christ is through transfiguration icons. If you followed my work these past 10 years, you know that I've made a deep study of icons of transfiguration or metamorphosis, which are considered to be two-way channels of energy. We are not just looking at an image of Christ transfiguring into light. He is actually present in our space at this moment. He is with us through this image because these icons were created with the intention that they are sacred mirrors and gateways into other, realm, into other realms. Through prayer and meditation, believers could actually come to perceive the divine light that is emanating from the heart of Christ at this moment during his transfiguration, and we could become like him through a mystic union by linking with the divine Christ energy through the image. These icons are all about other dimensional, otherworldly experiences in enabling us to go beyond the veil into the immaterial world, into the divine realm. In fact, this is what we see in these icons, is heaven opens. A rip in the fabric of, of space-time is seen in the left and right-hand corners. 
Moses and Elijah are transported from their heavenly dwellings by angels and led to a meeting with the glorified Christ, with the illuminated Christ. The heavenly veil that we see torn open here now with Elijah was torn open at Jesus' baptism, at his transfiguration, and at his crucifixion, meaning all three events have to do with the with the movement or the unveiling of the ultimate cosmic mysteries. What is it that is beyond the veil that separates us from the divine realm? What is in that divine realm and how can we bring it into our world today? And here we see Elijah stepping into the field of the illuminated Christ, just as we are stepping into it as we sit in our sacred space in our home or where ever we are at this moment. Christianity is founded on the premise that Christ is God incarnate. Paul said that Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is the image of the invisible God. He is God made visible. And the question then becomes, can God be made visible through an image? If Christ is an image of God, he must then reflect God or something of God. And can Christ, therefore, as an image, be imaged himself? Can this image of Christ transmit the holy vibration of Christ to us? And can we receive this image, or excuse me, can we receive this divine vibration through the image? Or is this like asking if a beam of sunlight reflected on water can somehow leap from the water and take on life? The answer to these questions is definitely yes, according to the iconodules, those who were the lovers of the image, who believed that the image would show us the way to our own divinity, that we could indeed connect with the cosmic Christ through an image. And I will further explain how this could work as we continue. But for the moment, I want to take our journey a little bit deeper in these In these images, we're going to see very often Christ is shown performing hand signs called mudras. A mudra is a spiritual gesture and an energetic seal of authenticity that's employed in the art of communicating with spirit. So if we want to enhance our connection with the cosmic Christ, we're told that we can mirror what he's doing in these images. So it's a very good idea for all of us now to signal Christ that we are present, that we are making a seal, a bond with him at this moment. This mudra that he is signaling in this transfiguration icon is the apana or descending vital energy mudra. It's formed by touching the tips of the ring finger and middle finger with the tip of the thumb. The purpose of this mudra is to regulate the excretory systems of the body. It detoxifies and purifies the body and also helps in digestion. And maybe this answers why everybody has been stocking up on toilet paper lately. They know that we're going to be in for a real big detox coming up, and we're going to start using our detox mudra. When practicing any mudra, it helps to focus the mind on the desired results, as then we're directing consciousness from multiple levels. So when we're engaging the transfiguration icon, our goal is to receive the divine Christ light, the compassion of the cosmic Christ, in order that we can wear our robes of light. So as you engage this icon with the Apana Mudra, as your seal, as your link, visualize yourself now putting on that robe. Visualize yourself in this incredible space of the Christ light, wearing that robe of light, allowing it to empower your actions of kindness, generosity, and compassion as we move out into our new world. Jesus' message after the transfiguration was very powerful and apropos to our present moment as well. When the disciples saw Jesus suddenly morph into light, they were terrified. They were absolutely afraid of what they were seeing. This was their friend Jesus from Nazareth who suddenly is morphing into light. Jesus' message for them was crystal clear. Rise, he said, and do not be afraid. Rise and do not be afraid. 
And that is our calling. We are to raise our frequency, raise our level of compassion and kindness in our lives so that we are shining and radiant beings in the model of the cosmic Christ. So let's take a moment to use our mudra to make that connection with the cosmic Christ, to invite him into our spirit, into our soul, to transmit to us now the most holiest vibration and allow that to begin to move through our body and our soul and our mind and our spirit and to guide our actions from this moment forward. This face that we see in this transfiguration icon is well known to art historians. It's from a fifth century icon that was discovered in 1962 at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai. It is as close to a photograph of the living Christ as we will perhaps ever see. I will show you an image shortly of the actual living Christ and you will see that these two faces will indeed match. As we look at this icon, his eyes are incredibly haunting. At the same time, they're bathing us in utter compassion. And we notice once again that he is signaling us with a mudra, a different mudra, the prana mudra, another extremely helpful hand signal in, in linking with the cosmic Christ in this icon, but also for embodying something that we all need just a little bit more of right now, and that is vital energy. This mudra is formed by touching the tips of the, of the ring finger and the little finger with the tip of the thumb, which strengthens the immune system and gives the body the resilience to heal itself. This mudra activates the root chakra, which promotes stability, calmness, and self-confidence. Again, qualities that we definitely need to bring up from within ourselves right now. We're told that this mudra is capable of healing more than a hundred different diseases. Who knows? It may be extremely helpful at this time as our world is now challenged with a virus that's going around our planet. Maybe with our compassion and our link with the cosmic Christ, we can do something about that. That's my intention anyway. So as we're looking at this image, we're feeling the compassion of the cosmic Christ. We're linking with the cosmic Christ. And now we're plugging into the true mysteries of how we can ultimately make our way, our own ascension in this world. St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai is home to this incredible transfiguration mosaic. It's also from the fifth or sixth century. And in the center, we see Christ in a sort of a blue cosmic egg with eight rays streaming from his body. The light in the cosmic egg goes from light blue to dark blue. This indicates that he is in the known world when it's light and going into the unknown world when it goes into the darkness. But once again, we see the same face. We see Christ offering us a mudra. This time the earth mudra is performed by touching the tip of the ring finger with the tip of the thumb. The mudra is very efficient, we're told, at strengthening and healing the body. And it also activates, once again, the root chakra, which again, promotes a sense of stability and self-assurance. This is what we're establishing for ourselves by putting down this layer of compassion in our lives as a layer of stability. Because we know that if we live by the golden rule, if we're exuding compassion, love, and kindness, that that is what we will bring back into our world. So I'm offering this as another example of a beautiful transfiguration icon that you can use, especially with the signaling of the mudra, to embody the compassion of the cosmic Christ, but also to enhance your confidence, and your stability. Wonderful, wonderful image. St. Catherine's is also home to this incredible ascension image, again, from the sixth century. In Jesus' story, we have the baptism, we have the transfiguration, we have the crucifixion, we have the resurrection, and then we have the ascension. And you know you're looking at an ascension image of Jesus when he's in an orb of stars or surrounded by stars, sitting on a rainbow. And this establishes the early Christian belief 
that one, Jesus ascended, and that his ascension was indeed connected with the celestial realms and also with the rainbow. We see the same thing here in this fifth century mosaic from Greece, from St. David of Thessaloniki, in which we see an unbearded Jesus. Jesus is a youth now, sitting in the rainbow uh, with other figures who are gathered around him. And this, it, this illustrates for us a very important early Christian teaching. And that is that a glorified body or a body of shining rainbow light is the form which the early church believed that not only Christ possessed after his resurrection and ascension, but also all the saved, those who are whole, holy, complete, and compassionate, will also one day share this form. This is the critical prophecy in all of Christian teaching, this promise that one day you and I will morph from our flesh and blood bodies into a light body, a glorified light body, just like Jesus achieved or demonstrated for us in his resurrection and ascension. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul remarks that Christians are, in fact, right now, in the process of transfiguring into heavenly light beings. He said, and we all, who with unveiled faces contemplating the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. That is the promise. There is no difference between my body and your body and the body that Jesus inhabited. The difference is he knew more about what to do with it than you and I do. And our goal is to embody that compassion of the cosmic Christ so that we can lay a stable foundation to receive the rest of the codes and teachings that will enable us to complete our own metamorphosis. This illustration from the 6th century Rabalu Gospels from Syria also portray the ascension of Christ in a very similar form. As art historians have noted, this ascension image, perhaps more than any other, establish the pattern for all future ascension images of Jesus. In it, we see him in the rainbow ring, riding upon the Merkaba, the celestial vehicle of the cosmic Christ. This is the celestial throne chariot that the Essenes, the Jewish mystics at the time of Jesus, had written extensively about. Jesus was a Merkaba mystic, a master of this throne chariot. And it was upon this celestial throne chariot and the rainbow ring that he ascended to the new Jerusalem, the celestial scion. In my work, I have gone into great detail to link the correspondence of the images of early Christianity of Jesus ascending in the rainbow ring to the Tibetan images of what is called the great perfection. In the great perfection teaching, we're taught that the human body is designed to have its frequency accelerated until it spins itself into a five-colored rainbow light body and then resurrects into that form. After the body has attained the rainbow light body state of being, we then have the ability to phase back and forth from the rainbow light body into a physical flesh and blood form if we choose. The reason why we would choose to, one, commit ourselves to attaining this state of perfection, and once we have attained it, to phasing back into a physical flesh and blood body, is so that we could deliver the greatest amount of compassion possible. So the Tibetan rainbow body teaching, just like Christ's teachings about ascension, are motivated by the desire to establish a compassionate world or a world of compassion, light, and love. And the reason we pursue these mysteries is so that we can become more compassionate beings. In these images of the Tibetan guru Padmasambhava, we see that he holds a resurrection stick. He wears a crown of glory. He has golden rays and rainbow rays coming off his body. And he holds the Vajra, the Tibetan symbol for compassion and action, and he sits on a lotus throne. I'm going to come back to these symbols momentarily. But for now, I want to make a a very important connection for you. And that is, the Tibetans say that just seeing 
these images of Padmasambhava in his rainbow body awakens our own rainbow body. And I am of the opinion that Christianity has derived its teachings about transfiguration icons and Jesus morphing into light and ascension icons from these very same sources. The Tibetans teach that as an enlightened being, Padmasambhava has the ability to transmit the frequency or vibration of enlightenment to seekers via his physical image, which is equal to pure spirit energy. What this means is that the images of Padmasambhava in, the, in his rainbow body transmits the codes or vibrations of that perfect state. This is why the Tibetans teach that just seeing these images resets our own frequency, our vibration, and activates our own rainbow body. We practice activating our light body, our glory body, our resurrection body, our ascension body by contemplating, meditating, and reflecting on the images that are presented here, be it Padmasambhava in his light body or Jesus. They both teach exactly the same principle. The image, be it an icon of Christ or the icon of Padmasambhava, puts you in the energy field of the guru. The eyes are the windows to the soul. So we're making a direct eye-to-eye, soul-to-soul contact with Padma and Sam, Padmasambhava and Jesus through these images. The Tibetans teach that we in the image of Padmasambhava are two extremes. We have a flesh and blood body, but not as much compassion as we would like to have when we're not radiating rainbows. On the other hand, Padmasambhava has a body that, that's made of rainbows, as does the resurrected Christ. And they both have boundless and impartial compassion. When we put these two extremes together in the rainbow body meditation or the meditation on the icons of Christ and his resurrection body, we move in the direction of manifesting as a being with a flesh and blood body and unlimited compassion and maybe a few rainbows thrown in for decoration. Now, imagining that we are just like Christ or Padmasambhava is not like me telling you you're going to turn into a Learjet or a flying airplane. We already have this within us. It is our true nature according to Christianity, Buddhism, and other sacred teachings. We already are this illumined, glorious being. The purpose of these meditations is to become conscious of that aspect of our intrinsic nature. So if Padmasambhava or images of Christ are perhaps not resonating with you, may I suggest an image of the white Tara, the Buddhist goddess of compassion. May I suggest the Virgin Mary, who is also portrayed with her many colored cloak or garment, symbolic of her attainment of the glory body, the rainbow body, the body of compassion. In this painting, we see Mary wearing this colored cloak with the star on her shoulder, indicate she's, indicating she's in her star body, her light body, and she wears her plasma crown, indicating that her consciousness is expanded into the universal, into the cosmic domains. Christianity, and especially Gnostic Christianity, and Tibetan Buddhism share similar language. They share similar teachings because their source is the same. It's cosmic. This is not a Christian teaching. It's not a Tibetan teaching. It's a cosmic teaching. It's coming from the risen ones of all the world's sacred traditions. In fact, in the Gospel of Philip, second century Gnostic Gospel, we're told the Lord rose from the dead. He became as he was, but now his body was perfect, meaning whole, holy, complete, and compassionate. He possessed flesh, but this flesh was true flesh. Our flesh isn't true. Ours is only an image of the true, says Philip. Our true flesh, our true nature, is a being in a glorious rainbow light body, attained by Padmasambhava, attained by Jesus in his resurrection, and attained by others, and attainable by us as well. 
You may feel like, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not quite ready to go full Christ light body at this moment. And that's okay. But what I am asking you to do and inviting you to do is to begin to embody the compassion of the cosmic Christ as a way to transform our world and to transform your world, to move the needle towards wholeness, holiness, compassion, and perfection. And in so doing, you will make an immense contribution to the new thought sphere of the new humanity that we are all building at this very moment. As Corinthians says, the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And this is a major message of the cosmic Christ that all that we see around us suddenly because of our the crisis and the cocooning that we've all been doing in these past few weeks and maybe a month for some has led us to realize to, to go into a deep state of reflection realize that you know a lot of this stuff around us is, is wonderful but it's transient and what is absolutely eternal is our soul and our soul's quest and the cosmic christ asks us to remember that we all have this light body within us. Its powers are almost beyond our comprehension. The powers of kindness, generosity, and compassion can utterly transform our world in the blink of an eye. But even more than that, it's ultimately the way, according to the Tibetans and early Christian teaching, that we will ultimately transcend this transient realm. As the Gospel of Philip says, we must become perfect, meaning whole, holy, complete, and compassionate before leaving this world. And that is the message of the cosmic Christ. In traditional Christianity, they talk about this as being born again. But being born again is really nothing more than actually attaining the light body of Christ, the rainbow body. Christianity teaches that we must allow the spirit to enter into us, to join our spirit with the cosmic Christ. This brings me a lot of comfort because it tells me that I don't have to go full rainbow body, full glory body, resurrection body on my own. There are others that have done it before me, the risen ones, and they are here to assist me. I just need to find a way to invite that spirit into my body, to ask them to assist me in my resurrection and ascension. Christ lives in all of us when we do this. And in my view, one of the most direct ways for us to invite the spirit of the cosmic Christ into our lives is through the images of the resurrected Christ. The mystery of being born again into the light body is now revealed. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations which is Christ in you, the hope and glory. Christ is in you. Christ is in all of us. This potential is in all of us and ready to be activated at this time. And that is the teaching of the risen Lord. After the resurrection, Jesus made a number of appearances to a select group of disciples. These usually took place on a high mountaintop and involved Jesus teaching them about heavenly places, the garments of light which they would be given, and their own ascent. All of the Gnostic teachings were given after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. This is why I study them so deeply, because I know that that is the teaching that will ultimately provide the keys to our ascension. And here I've highlighted the mountaintop and also the cloud upon which Jesus rides, which is now a simplified form of the Merkaba vehicle that we saw earlier in the Rabalu Gospel. So we see the disciples gathered around Jesus. We see them absorbing these teachings, and now we know of the connection to the Merkaba mystics of the, of the Jewish mystical tradition, of the rainbow light body tradition of the Tibetans. These are all cosmic teachings originally brought here by beings I refer to as the risen, they who have completed their ascension and are now entering into our world to assist us in our own. Because humans are made in the perfect image of God, we have the spiritual capacity and the physical capacity to participate in or mirror 
Jesus's divine glory as image bearers, and we activate our light bodies. The Bible is direct and specific about this, saying, as was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, in other words, of DNA, a carbon body, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We already have this within us. We just need the spirit and the compassion of the cosmic Christ to activate our own glory body or resurrection body. Earlier, we noted the resurrection stick, the crown of glory, the Vajra, symbol of compassion and action, and the rays of golden light and, and rainbow light coming off the body of Kadmas, Padmasambhava. Now we note that we see exactly the same symbolism in the resurrection images of Jesus, who wears the helmet of salvation and carries the rod of enlightenment, his holy resurrection stick. He wears his garment of light, and he has a rainbow ring around his body. These images are both illustrating the perfect state of wholeness, holiness, and compassion that all of us have already within us. And again, the promise is, is that there will come a moment in time when we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. And isn't it remarkable that at this time, we have a figure in the center of our world who is, has change spinning all around him and his name just happens to be Trump. The change that we're talking about here is a change into our ascended bodies, into our bodies of cosmic and compassionate light. And the assurance is that this can happen in the twinkling of an eye like that. And that is the promise of our time, that we are living in a moment where we will be able to activate our light bodies and transform our world. And what we need, in my view, to assist us in doing this are mirrors, images of the cosmic Christ guiding our imagination, letting us know that we are on that path. We all have two choices before us right now. Ever since Revelation 2012, and by that I mean the year 2012, that year of immense transformation, we have been living in the days of judgment. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 12, which is the final judgment, it says, I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and no one place, excuse me, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And there were open books, and one of them was the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their deeds as recorded in the books. Have you ever thought about this possibility that we're living in the judgment day time when all the books are open, when all our lives are transparent? Just ask people that have been outed because of the Me Too movement. They've been judged. All their lives, their books have now been opened. And they are experiencing that moment of judgment. And we're told that will all come for all of us. And this is why it's now a time for us to find that place of compassion and kindness, and generosity and stability within us, that spirit of forgiveness. Because we can either focus on punishing people continually, or we can focus on finding that compassion within to ultimately forgive them. But of course, in order to forgive, we need justice first. And we need that balance in our world of equal justice for all. So I'm presenting to you these images of Christ on the rainbow as imagery to feed your imagination, as imagery that can activate your own light body, like John the Revelator, who's, who's seen here, going over the rainbow bridge of consciousness, peering into the heavenly realm, the throne of Sion, where the ascended Christ dwells, and we see all the other rainbow light beings that are around him. As John said, there was a throne of God. His servants stood in the place of perpetual heavenly light. The Essenes believed that this perpetual heavenly light 
would one day bathe the entire planet, bathe us in that light, that cosmic light of compassion, of love, of truth, and kindness. And we're almost there. And we can bring that in in an accelerated way by all reaching deep within and raising our vibration closer to the wholeness, holiness, and compassion of the cosmic Christ, who once again has his resurrection stick, his crown of glory, his golden rays, just like Padmasambhava. The images will show us the way. We can enter into this higher divine state through the image. It's already within us. We just need to activate it. Padmasambhava in his light body, holding the Vajra, the symbol for compassion and action, the cosmic Christ. It's the exact same state of being. And I make this comparison, one, to illuminate and to draw these connections together and to bring a comfort level that if some are deeply comfortable with the, the connection of a Christ-like being, that perhaps you will find more comfort in connecting with the Tibetan guru, Padmasambhava, or other beings who radiate or have manifested the rainbow light body. But for us who follow the Christ path, we are making eye-to-eye -eye contact now, soul-to-soul -soul contact with Christ in his rainbow light body. And he is transmitting to us the codes that can activate our own light body to stimulate our ability to manifest that unlimited light of compassion and love. Jesus told us through his crucifixion, or showed us through his crucifixion, what all of us were capable of doing. He pulled back the veil and revealed the mystery for us. And to me, one of the most profound images of Christ on the, in the crucifixion is by John Van Eyck, who is actually an alchemist, the inventor of oil painting, and was literally considered to be a spy. In this profound image, we see Christ on the cross, not suffering, not bloodied, not beaten, as we see in traditional Catholic images of the crucifixion, but rather we see him as an illuminated being. We see him in his glory body, his resurrection body, his rainbow light body, making eye to eye, soul to soul contact with us, transmitting the rays of the resurrection body to us at this very moment. I will share with you a very powerful personal testimony with this image. I assure you that if you connect with this image, it can, it can produce profound things in your life. My wife, Claire, suffers immeasurably from migraines that I, I can't even believe what she goes through when she has one of these migraines. I, I can't even watch it, let alone contemplate experiencing the level of pain and suffering that she feels. And one day I, I put, this was, happened a while ago, I, I decided to use the power of this image. And so I started doing hands-on healing with Claire when she would have these moments. And before I would do the hands-on healing, I would call up this image in my imagination. I would ask Jesus to, to empower my hands, to light up my hands. And then I would put them on, on Claire's head, and she could feel it. She could feel the energy coming through my hands, coming from Christ in this image into her head. And then one day I realized, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, not, doing, I'm not doing this entirely correctly. I've, I've visualized myself connecting with the cosmic Christ and bringing that compassion and healing ability into my hands but I haven't activated my crown chakra. And so then I started doing that. And suddenly the, the power in my hands dramatically increased. I, I could literally feel it just, just turning up almost instantly. And then I realized that I still wasn't doing it completely right. I realized that what I need to do is to actually utilize the power of the whole image and to begin to visualize my whole body illuminated with light. So now, when I do a healing or do healing work on Claire, I activate my hands. I activate my crown. I activate my whole body and my feet, and I visualize myself levitating on that light. 
I encourage you to try that as one way that you begin to use these images for practical purposes in our lives. You might consider suiting up in your suit of cosmic armor, your glory body, before you go outside. Because if this image can transmit the healing vibration to us that I can transmit through my body to my wife, isn't it possible that it can also create a field of protection around my body? So now every time before I leave the house, Claire tells me to put on my cosmic cloak, put on your cosmic cloak, and I do. I take that moment to visualize myself with my full suit of cosmic armor on, my helmet of salvation, my breastplate of righteousness, my belt of truth, my sandals of peace, and my fully activated light body, radiating this light, love, and compassion to everyone and everything I come into contact with. The body of the perfect ultimately was said to have become transmaterial or semi-angelic, which fulfills the teaching of the Gospel of Luke. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of resurrection. That's another term for the risen, the children of resurrection. That is our quest. That is our goal, to become equal to the angels as children of God. The mission of the perfect was to assist and show others the way to attain their angelic status, release their divine spark from the earthly cycle of incarnation, and to return to the glorified light body. And that indeed is the goal in our world today, just as it was then. And it is my goal as a teacher of ascension, as an ascension scholar, as someone who has researched and taught this subject for over 20 years to help you to move your needle into greater wholeness, holiness, compassion, and ultimately into your own angelic light body. In our world, we are now confronted by people who seek to do a, to mimic the power of our resurrection body. I speak of the transhumanists, I speak of the AI and 5G advocates who say all this business about an organic resurrection body and light body is nonsense. The way forward is to mesh our flesh with technology, to activate the body's capabilities by merging it with nanotechnology and artificial intelligence and to have 5G's fires running through our veins. I am and have been for a very long time advocating that you and I have a choice at this very moment. And our choice must be to remain organic beings, to activate the powers of our flesh and blood body through the spirit of the cosmic Christ, through the compassion of the cosmic Christ, not through technology. I will be going into great detail about that in my upcoming webinar, The Rising ascension and the new humanity and i'd like to invite all of you to participate that in that absolutely critical workshop so please consider joining us on april 18th and 19th here at portal to ascension i want to turn a page here and follow the story of the cosmic christ just for a moment i want to go to his birth and see how his story manifests as a cosmic being. We're looking here at one of my favorite annunciation scenes is by Carlo Crivelli. We see two angels, Archangel, excuse me, the Archangel Gabriel and a high priest who are standing or kneeling before Mary, who is receiving the dove of the Holy Spirit. The dove is entering into her crown chakra. It's come from the cosmic realms. It's come from the heavenly realms through a rip in the fabric of space-time. This is another story involving the openings of a hole in heaven or a hole in the fabric of space-time. And we see the beam of light coming from this rip in the fabric of space-time going into the crown chakra of Mary with Gabriel announcing that Mary will be the bearer of this Christ child. The Christ child, of course, is already in his glory body or resurrection body. He's getting ready to phase out of that body into his earthly flesh and blood body as an agent of the creator. And that's what we see in all of these images where we see the star child, as I call Jesus here, manifesting from out of the higher dimensional realms as an illuminated being. 
these images come from a story, a sixth century Gnostic gospel called the Revelation of the Magi. In this story, the Revelation of the Magi, the, the, the Magi are not following a star. We are told that they are following a star child, the cosmic Christ. This is the premise of the Revelation of the Magi, a sixth century, excuse me, eighth century Gnostic gospel that was translated into English by Dr. Brent Landau. The book tells the familiar story of the three Magi following a star in search of the Christ star, excuse me, of the Christ child, but from a completely different perspective. The star child appears in the sky, descends from the heavens, which open like a great gate, and he manifests inside of a cave in which he invites the Magi to come inside. The star child opens up the gate, the Magi come inside, and they see that this is in fact Christ before him. Christ tells the Magi that he has been sent from the Father for the salvation of all humanity and instructs them to follow the star to Bethlehem to see his birth in human form. So he's going to morph out of his light body form or phase out of his light body form into his flesh and blood form. And he also tells them, by the way, that he has appeared in the past and in the future. So that's what we see in these images now of the, the revelation of the Magi, of Mary bringing the Christ child on her Merkaba throne into the earth plane. In this triptych, we see the Christ child in the center and fully illuminated as a, a radiant being, a luminous being. We see the Magi pointing upward, and here's the star child manifesting out of a star, carrying the cross with him. This is very unusual and very important because it tells us that he brought his instrument of transmutation with him. He brought the cross as an instrument of crossing beyond the veil with him. Very much like what we see in the Zoroastrian images of Ahura Mazda. This crossover historically is evidenced by the fact that the early Jews in 600 BC when they experienced their period of exile in Babylon came into contact with Zoro the Zoroastrian teachings about Ahura Mazda, the god of light, who is seen in Iranian artwork riding upon a winged ring holding a ring of cosmic sovereignty that symbolizes that he is in his glory body, his light body, or his resurrection body. In present day Zoroastrianism, these images are a reminder of our purpose and mission in life, which is to live in such a way that our soul progresses towards our union with the God of light, Ahura Mazda. The images are complementary, and so are the story, because I believe they're originally coming from the same cosmic source. We are talking about a revelation of the star child, a revelation of a risen being coming into our world. Here's Sassetta's version of the Magi following the star child as this luminous ball of light. What we're actually seeing is the cosmic Christ spirit breaking from the fifth dimensional world into the third dimensional world and preparing to morph into a human form, one that is visible to humans. And that's what we see in these resurrection images of Jesus, is that he has morphed into his light body form. Another favorite is Roger Vanderveden's, where once again, we see the, the Magi looking up at the Christ child and the orb of light, clearly a cosmic traveler, a light being who has come from the cosmic domains with a message about ultimate compassion and transformation and preparing now to morph into a physical flesh and blood form to deliver his teaching about light, love, and compassion. And ultimately, the teaching surrounds the belief or focuses on the belief that we all will one day mirror Christ in his ascension and resurrection. We all will attain that rainbow light body. In this image, of course, we once again see the Christ child in, an, in a radiant halo of light. We see the watcher angels opening up a hole in the fabric of space-time. The watcher angels are the risen ones who are present for the arrival, the emergence of this cosmic being who manifested on Earth 2,000 years ago in order to show us the potential that is within us as cosmic beings. And as I discuss in my forthcoming book, The Return of the Risen, 
the Essenes in the perfect light body. The meeting of the Magi was not a chance meeting. This was all planned by the Essenes. They were following what theologians call the star prophecy, in which the Essenes were anticipating the arrival of a high celestial being who would manifest on the earth plane to show us how to transform into celestial beings. Pliny mysteriously claimed that the Essenes themselves had been on earth for thousands of ages, hinting that they are an eternal race that exists outside of time. These are the risen ones. They're referred to as the immovable race of perfect light humans, the immovable race, or simply the race. I call them the risen. And their, their mission was to call in this high celestial being so that this being then could assist us in manifesting a planet based on love, light, righteousness, and compassion, and a planet in which souls could attain their ultimate cosmic divinity. To the Essenes, angelification, or changing our body into our light body form, the angelic light body, was a return to our original primordial state of perfection. Our ultimate quest is to unite Earth with the otherworldly realm of light and join the greater family of light, the risen ones. And that is what is happening on our planet right now. We are all gathering together, absorbing these teachers, un these teachings, uniting as one in order, in order to return Earth in all of humanity to the family of light. Again, the Lord rose from the dead. He was a star being who came to show us the way towards our own ascension. The Essenes community rule tells us this high heavenly being would reveal the mysteries of eternal being concealed from humankind. And at that time, the righteous will be rewarded with healing, great peace and a long life and fruitfulness together with every everlasting blessing and eternal joy and life without end, a crown of glory and a garment of majesty and unending light. That's our goal, to get that crown of glory and that robe of majesty and unending light. And as I will talk in my presentation, The Risen, my workshop, it is such a remarkable synchronicity that the word corona means crown. And this is this coronavirus is now giving us a, an incredible cosmic opportunity to go within and to manifest that crown of light. And also our robe of light, which was transmitted to Jesus at his resurrection. In Leonardo and Del Vecchio's painting, we see the, the, the vibration of the cosmic spirit, of the, of the Holy Spirit manifesting and being transmitted into the crown chakra of Jesus. The two angels wait beside him and they offer to him the robe of light that is to accompany his crown of glory. The transfiguration is what follows the baptism of Jesus. When John the Baptist, the Essene mystic and initiator, baptized Jesus, he put a transmission of a vibration into Jesus's earthly body that would enable him to wear his robe of light, his cloak of light, the cloak of the illumined ones. And this is why immediately after the resurrection, excuse me, after the baptism, Jesus takes the disciples up to the top of the mountain and reveals himself as a being of light. He transfigures, he demonstrates to the, to the disciples the capability that is within all of us. This robe is called the robe of light, the robe of sanctity, the robe of glory, the shining garment, the garment of light, the beaming garment it exudes something called exousia, which means authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, the right to act, ability, privilege, capacity, and strength. Everything that the powers that be are trying to take away from us at this very moment. So if we want to recover our authority, our power, our capacity, our privilege, our liberty, then one way to do that is to begin to cloak ourselves in our robe of light. And how do we do that? By connecting with images of Jesus in his light body through the icons as I'm presenting, but also through acts of kindness, generosity, and compassion. This is exactly what Jesus demonstrated for us immediately after the transfiguration. He begins performing the miracles. The first miracle, two blind men receive sight. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. 
but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them, and he said, what do you want me to do for you? And he asked, Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. He had compassion on them, and they were given sight. That's one of the first examples of compassion in the story of Jesus in his earth life. In another, Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large, large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. But Jesus replied, no, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, answered the disciples. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000. This is the power of exponentialism. Through compassion, Jesus enabled the disciples to tap into a power within themselves. Did Jesus split those loaves or did the disciples do it? Whichever way, it's the power of exponentialism. The 12 took the loaves and they split them. And then the people that had those loaves split those. This is the power that we need to tap into our world right now. This responsibility to transform our world into a planet of love, light, righteousness, and compassion doesn't end with you. You're the beginning. What if you told five people, or, and they told five people, and they told 10 people, and they told 10 people? This is the power of exponentialism that we all need to tap into at this time. Then there's the story of the leper. No one was allowed to touch a leper for hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. But suddenly, a, a leper came before him and asked Jesus, are you willing? Can you make me whole? This, this leper knew all about Jesus and that he had the ability to do it. The question was not about whether Jesus could do it. The question was, did Jesus have the compassion to heal him? Jesus answered that question by what he did next. He stretched out his hand and he touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed and immediately the leprosy left him. Mark's account says that Jesus was moved with compassion. It was the compassion of the cosmic Christ that healed the leper, that divided those loaves and fishes, and healed the blind man as well. Now, understand what Jesus was doing when he healed this leper. He risked becoming infected too. If he were us, and he was out at the store, and someone's walking around with coronavirus, we'd all be grabbing for the hand sanitizer or be headed for the door. Because interacting with someone with coronavirus is almost illegal in our world. The people that have this virus are now almost to the level of the lepers of the ancient world. People are so freaked out about this, and for very good reason. But Jesus was willing to become ceremonial unclean in addition to risking having leprosy. He already knew he was at such a high frequency of compassion, light, and love that he could resist the leprosy. But what about becoming unclean? Anybody who touched a leper was said to be ritually unclean. What Jesus did next was very strange and very important for us to understand. He said to the man, Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. Leviticus had said that if somebody is healed from leprosy, leprosy, he needs to tell the priest so the priest can verify the healing. So the leper went to the priest, and the priest knew exactly what this meant. 
This healing was Jesus's way of announcing to the priest that the Messiah, the cosmic Christ, had arrived, and it truly began his mission. He, be, he came to show us what we can do and how we can use the compassion to defeat a terrible beast that one day would rise up on the earth. That beast has arisen. That beast is here now. It has many powers, many terrible powers, artificial intelligence, 5G, viruses. It's coming at us right now and it seeks to put a mark on our forehead or a mark on our hand, a tattoo that says you've been vaccinated from coronavirus. It will enable us to be tracked. We can't go back into society if Bill Gates has his way. Mr. Gates, of course, is a number one candidate for that beast of revelation who wants to put that mark on us. And this is why it's time for us to rise. Some people say, you know, we didn't give our consent to this. But the answer is, actually, we did. Every time we've gone online, every time we've used our phone, every time you've used an email, anytime you've done anything, with this technology, you've given your consent to these people that you want this technology. You've paid for it. You bought it. That's their point of view. So we have to get beyond any kind of blame in this scenario. We have to push back, not with hatred, but rather we have to push back with compassion. We have to overcome them by showing others a better way to live. That is our quest and our goal at this time. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and passion and patience. And if someone like Bill Gates needs compassion, right up the root chakra, that's how we send him compassion. Because he's got obviously a lot of work to do. And I think Jesus would agree with us that what is being done to us right now is criminal on a cosmic scale, and it requires compassion on a cosmic scale. We must meet the beast. And the thing is, the book of Revelation, as I, as I will explain in the Risen, tells us the beast loses. The 144,000 followers of Christ with the glory in their foreheads defeat that beast. And that is our quest. Dear children, let us not love with only words, but let's love with actions and in truth. Let's put the spirit of the word compassion into our doing, because compassion isn't concerned with our material well-being and material things. It's concerned with our spirit and alleviating the suffering of others. So let's be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave us. The icon makers believed that we can synchronize with the cosmic Christ through the image, because emanating from his heart and transmitted through his eyes is an ambient magnetic field of love, a field of compassion. Through the image, the Christ energy can bypass our conscious mind and literally influence us at the quantum level in a non-local way. In the unified field, the Christ field, the field of energy and information which connects all things physical and governs all the laws of the universe, the field where there is no separation between me, you, and Christ, you are connected to everything and everyone. We're quantumly entangled with the cosmic Christ. Thus, the more connected you are to the field, through the image, which acts like a laser to focus the power of your soul and your actions, then we can experience the more non-local effects through the cosmic Christ. This is our quest. This is our goal. And this is what we are doing at this moment by connecting through Christ through these images. Compassion wires the brain. Compassion, according to medical science, causes the left brain, or excuse me, the left side of the brain's prefrontal cortex region just above the eyes. Compassion is good for the heart. It's, compassion is about warm emotional contact, 
when we connect with others in a deep emotional way, we produce the, the hormone oxytocin. One of the key roles of this hormone is in the maintenance of the cardiovascular health. It dilates the arteries and reduces blood pressure and also helps clear out potentially disease-causing agents. Compassion slows aging. Research shows a strong connection between compassion and the vaginal tone, which is the term that describes the health and fitness of the vagus nerve, much as the muscle tone describes the muscles. The vagus nerve controls the body's inflammatory response, known as the inflammatory reflex. And as we increase vaginal tone through compassion, we improve the body's ability to reduce inflammation. Compassion improves relationships. Research shows that compassion fosters emotional connections between two people. A structured practice of compassion meditation improves the quality of personal and professional relationships. It motivates kindness. Compassion quickly evolves into kindness, where we are moved to do something to ease another person's suffering. We not only share the pain, but we want the, person, the other person's suffering eased and erased. And ultimately, compassion fuels our hot wheels. In the image of the cosmic Christ, he has the activated crown, the activated healing hands, the activated light body, and the activated wheels of the cosmic Christ called the Ophanum of the Merkaba throne. I want to turn now to the crucifixion, excuse me, the resurrection morning on Easter morning. We're going to do that by turning to this incredible painting, The Morning of the Resurrection by Edward Burns Jones. The scene depicted is Mary Magdalene's visit to the empty tomb, where she encounters the resurrected Christ accompanied by angels. She beholdeth two angels, says the book of John, two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. As Matthew describes it, it was laid on the Sabbath day, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb, and an angel of the Lord, one of the risen ones, descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was as lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the watchers did quake and became as dead men. These are the Roman soldiers. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Mary Magdalene, Fear not ye, for I know ye seek Jesus, who hath been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, even as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. This moment is the fulfillment of the Essene plan involving the watcher angels and the risen and the Essenes to infuse humanity with a cosmic impulse of energy that reverberates to this day. In fact, we are on the receiving edge of that infusion at this very moment. As Matthew describes, his appearance was as lightning and his raiment white as snow. That's describing both the angel who rolled away the stone and the resurrected Jesus, who now has transfigured into his light body or his resurrection body. And this is the key teaching of all the Ascension Masters, is that Christ came to demonstrate how we can rise into the ascended realms. In these images, especially here in Fra Angelico's Resurrection from the Tomb, we see the resurrected Christ rising from the tomb and also rising upon the Shroud of Turin. And I want to talk about the Shroud uh, as we continue here. Here's another example from Fra Angelico where we see a collection of tools in front of Jesus. We see Mary Magdalene and the Mother Mary, Joseph, Nicodemus, and others are carrying Christ upon this linen shroud that we now call the Shroud of Turin. In this image, we see that Christ is already illuminated. He's golden. He's radiating light. He's a luminous being. But in between his resurrection, excuse me, in between being laid in the tomb and his resurrection, Jesus spent time in limbo, in the other world, in the realm where the righteous of all the Old Testament times and the pre-flood times were waiting for his arrival. And in Christian art, we see him descending into the underworld as this illuminated being, illuminated being carrying his rod of resurrection, preparing to free all of those who were waiting for his arrival. 
in these scenes, we see that he has got demons that are all around, that he will duke it out with, that he's overcome. These are the, the beasts of the ancient world. In this example here from the Kora Church in Istanbul, we see Jesus descending into limbo through a radiant portal or gateway. He wears his garment of luminous light, indicating he's already a light being, and he's gone into this otherworldly realm in order to retrieve the righteous from the pre-flood times. And then he rises on Easter morning. He appears to Mary Magdalene in the garden, wearing his luminous garment of light. And he tells her, do not touch me. Do not touch me, indicating that he's no longer in his physical flesh and blood body. He is now in his risen body. He is now in his light body. He's now in his glory body, a holographic type of body that is luminous, radiant, but still humanoid. It's a manifestation of his flesh and blood body. It's a return to his original form. And this is why in Christian art, in these nolo me tangere scenes or do not touch me scenes where Magdalene is seeing the risen Christ for the first time, we see that his cloak or his garment is covered with stars. It's because he is now in his ascended form. He's in his star body, his radiant body, his glory body, his light body. He has completed his earthly transformation. And he always in these scenes carries his resurrection stick. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Both medieval and Renaissance art began to depict the resurrected Christ by using the flag of St. George, which is therefore his symbol of resurrection. In the 15th and 16th century in Florence, Italy, we see these incredible images of Jesus rising from the tomb as a star being as a cosmic traveler preparing to return to his original form. So he phased in, in from his light body form, took on flesh and blood form, and then in his resurrection, phased back out and now wears his star cloak or resurrection body in this artwork. In this example here from Florence, we see he's literally got a cloak covered with six pointed stars, the same as the cloak of light of the angelic beings, as the risen beings. That cloak of light symbolizes the Shroud of Turin, which is the burial shroud of Christ. The shroud is a herringbone linen fabric measuring about 4.1 by 1.1 meters, or about 14 feet by three feet. It contains the double image of a man. Both the textile fiber that's used, the linen, and the processing method and its measures corresponding precisely to the eight by two Syrian cubits tell of a Middle Eastern origin of a Jewish environment and of funeral rituals of a specific time, the first century AD. Yesterday, April 11th, 2020, the Catholic Church did something quite remarkable. The Archbishop of Turin allowed the Shroud of Turin to be put on display. I, along with millions of other people, tuned in to watch this display and was somewhat surprised that they chose this specific angle to view the shroud. They didn't show the shroud in its complete form, presenting to you the illuminated body front and back of a crucified man. Instead, they only showed it from this angle, which made it very difficult to detect exactly what you were looking at. I don't know why they did that, but I'm just kind of perplexed that they did. That the fact is, is that one of the mysteries of the shroud, or one of the, the intriguing things about the shroud, is that the image of the resurrected man can only be seen from a distance. If you're looking at the shroud close up, you're not able to distinguish those physical features. And there's a reason why that is so, a scientific reason why that image can only be seen from a distance. And the reason why is because the image on the shroud is a photographic negative, not a painting of a man who was tortured, who was beaten, and who had had a crown of thorns impaled on his head and who carried a heavy crossbeam on his shoulders. It was only with the invention of photography 
And this first ever photograph of the shroud in 1898 that, that we were able to perceive what was actually encoded onto the shroud of Turin by this resurrected man who I am absolutely certain was Jesus or Yeshua. Again, it portrays a man who was crucified with nails driven through his wrists and his heels, exactly corresponding to the crucifixion story told in the New Testament. The Bible describes the mocking of Jesus before his crucifixion. Part of this mocking include the placement of a crown of thorns on his head. This was not done to other crucifixion victims, but the shroud shows evidence of wounds from sharp spike-like uh, utensils around the top of his head. Shroud experts believe that a crown of thorns is the source of the blood flows on the head of the man in the Shroud of Turin, pointing us to the reality that this is, in fact, the burial shroud of Christ. And I'm going to share with you some of the scientific evidence that tells us why we believe that this is truly the burial shroud of Jesus. For one thing, the face is a dead ringer for what we see on this early Christian icon. That is part of the historical evidence that we're going to show. But Dr. Gilbert Lavoie has pre presented evidence that the bloodstains occurred when the shroud, the person evidenced in the shroud, was actually standing upright and was levitating. The only way that that image could be, could be created based on the position of the feet with the toes on the right foot pointing downward and the left knee slightly more flexed is if this figure was suspended. In addition, there's no crushing from the buttocks, the back, or any body parts on the reverse side of the shroud. If a body was placed on that linen shroud, you would see evidence of that crushing. There is none. It's a perfect image, which is consistent with the hypothesis that Jesus was in fact levitating up in an upright position when that image was formed. His hair doesn't fall down on his shoulders in a crushed way. It's as if he's standing upright, again, supporting this hypothesis. In fact, 21st century science has now taken us to the point where we can now say for a fact, these are absolute facts. One, the shroud image was produced between 6 AD and 66 AD. It's been totally disproven that this is some kind of 13th century forgery. There is no possible way an artist in the 13th century could create the image that we see on the Shroud of Turin. Number two, pollen on the Shroud tells science it came from Jerusalem or it had been there at that time between 6 AD and 66 AD in the springtime. Three, from extensive microscopic, radiographic and chemical analysis, shroud scientists cannot find a method by which the image was produced. The shroud image cannot be reproduced even with modern technology. Experts are in agreement that the image on the linen shroud is not made up of any physical substance such as paint or pigment. So how did it get there? Again, there's no possible way that this is a forgery by some 13th century artist because there's no paint, there's no pigment, there's no evidence of any physical substance that produced this image. Why? Because it's not a photograph and it's not a physical image. While it manifests in the physical plane, it was produced by non-physical spiritual means. Scientists from Italy's National Agency for New Technologies, Energy and Sustainable Economic Development spent years trying to reproduce the shrouds markings with all the best advanced technology. And they came to the conclusion that the image on the shroud is in fact an alteration of the surface of the linen by some effect of light or radiation, something which also makes the linen turn yellow. The light energy was able to image the body and surrounding objects, including the markings on the tops of coins placed on his eyes and the flowers at exactly the same time that this image is produced. And they have demonstrated that certain key features of the image can be replicated by projecting short duration, high intensity ultraviolet rays on the surface of the linen. They can't exactly duplicate the, the image, but they know they're go headed in the right direction. It is thought by scientists that an ultraviolet energy source 
is the only thing that could have produced the image. And there is now this evidence that suggests that a crucified man 2,000 years ago emitted from within every cell of his body a sudden, short, intense burst of radiant energy from his body that we cannot replicate with technology. This is because it was produced from within his body, from within his soul. And this is what produced this incredible image that suggests, again, the source of light that is totally uniform came from within his body. This is not a photograph, but it is an artifact of the resurrection of Jesus. And again, when we look at the shroud, the markings clearly show a body that endured extreme torture, followed by crucifixion. In December of 2011, the scientists said that the shroud image was created by a superal, supernatural light. It cannot possibly be a medieval forgery, as you hear over and over again in mainstream media and coming from mainstream scientists who really, in the end, don't have a clue what they're talking about. These scientists have concluded that something akin to ultraviolet lasers, far beyond the capacity of medieval, medieval forgers and even our capacity today, could have created the image. It was created by a burst of light that came from within his body. And this is what we are now understanding about the Shroud of Turin, is that it in fact is an artifact of his resurrection but it is more than that even. If the Shroud of Turin was indeed created by the same phenomena that caused Jesus' body to glow brighter than the sun, then the extraordinary features of this sun, of, of this shroud, provide an explanation for how that image was created. It was created by Jesus phasing into light, by a burst of light from within his body as exemplified in all these wonderful images from Christian art. The story is true. Christ resurrected from the dead, came here as a cosmic traveler to show us how to do this. Now, the middle ground is the Shroud of Turin, of whether or not it is the actual burial shroud of Jesus, is open and unanswered. That's the middle ground here. In my view, it is an absolute proof of Christ's resurrection because Christian belief says something extraordinary happened in a tomb just over 2,000 years ago, and this cloth was known to have been present. It is considered the most important and most studied relic of Christianity. Used to be a relic. We're not gonna call it a relic anymore because now we are shifting our understanding. Newsflash, the shroud is no longer considered a relic. Beginning in the year 2000, Cardinal Ratzinger, later to be known as Pope Benedict XVI, wrote that the Shroud of Turin is a truly mysterious image which no human artistry was capable of producing. In some inexplicable way, it appeared imprinted upon cloth and believed to show the true face of Christ, the crucified and risen Lord. The shroud, he says, profoundly challenges and confounds human intellect, absolutely true. And science has tried to explain it, but no universally accepted process has been proposed to do so. The image on the shroud defies duplication by human hands because it was not created by human consciousness. In June, in June 2008, three years after he became Pope, Pope Benedict announced that the shroud would be publicly displayed in the spring of 2010 and stated that he would like to go to Turin to see it along with other pilgrimage, pilgrims. Claire and I were there. It was our, like our third date. We met in Egypt. Our first date was a cappuccino with the paws of the pyramid. Our second date was in Florida. Our third date, we went to see the shroud of Turin together when it went on display in 2010 one of the most life-changing events of my life. During his visit to Turin on May 2nd, 2010, Claire and I were there just a couple weeks afterward, Benedict described the Shroud of Turin as an extraordinary icon, the icon of Holy Saturday, corresponding in every way to what the gospel tells us of Jesus 
an icon written in blood, the blood of a man who is scourged, who is scourged, crowned with thorns, crucified, and whose right side was pierced, and who resurrected from the dead. The point is, it's not a relic anymore. It's an icon, an icon. We understand that. An icon is a two-way sacred mirror. It is a communications portal. It is a method of transmission. That is what the shroud is. It's a love letter from the resurrected Christ saying, here are my frequencies of resurrection, of love, light, and ultimate cosmic compassion. Here it is for you. Look at this shroud. Receive my blessing. I can't be there in person, but my shroud is there. I am in, in it, and it is in me. I am in you, and you are in me. We are all together. We are quantumly entangled. And through this icon, I can transmit to you the codes of, of resurrection. It is an icon written in his blood and his light and his love and his compassion. One of Benedict XVI's last acts of Pope was to authorize the broadcast of video of the Shroud from Turin Cathedral, first time it was seen on TV. In a carefully worded message, Pope Benedict asked and answered a rhetorical question. How is it that the faithful, like you, pause before this icon of a man scourged and crucified and resurrected. It is because the man of the shroud invites us to contemplate Jesus of Nazareth. That is the closest the Catholic Church has come to saying, this is the resurrection shroud of Christ. This is the resurrected Christ that is right before you. They will not take that extra step because why do you need the church after that? You don't. All we need is the shroud. This is my photo from 2010 on our first visit. Claire and I were five feet away from it. And it was the most profound thing to feel that love and light pouring off us and then to see this golden orb manifesting in our consciousness as we meditate it. The Pope said that when we look at the shroud, we see as in a mirror the suffering of Christ. No, we see the resurrection and love and compassion of Christ, the ultimate act of compassion. He gave over his life for us and left us the shroud as a trail for us to follow and a way for us to connect with him. Three years later, on March 30th, 2013, as part of Easter celebrations, there was an extraordinary exposition of the shroud in the Cathedral of Turin. It wasn't open to the public, but now this time Pope Francis is, is on it and he's saying so. Looking upon the man of the shroud, I, I make St. Francis of Assisi's prayer before the crucifix my own. Most high and glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart and grant me true faith, certain hope and perfect charity, sense and understanding, Lord, so that I may carry out your holy and true command. Amen. The man of the shroud is Christ, the compassionate Christ. And that is what we ask him to do is to infuse us with that compassion. Point is, Pope Francis and his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, have both described the Shroud of Turin as an icon. And in choosing this carefully worded description, we realize the popes are telling us something astounding about the Shroud. It's not a relic. It's a two-way method of communication. It's a sacred mirror. It's a way for us to connect with the cosmic Christ and to bring the cosmic Christ into our life. Even looking at a picture of the Shroud transmits those codes and vibrations. It's an icon of Christ's great love and compassion for humankind. I call it the icon of love, the cosmic Christ demonstration of the power of compassion. That's what the Shroud of Turin is. It's the icon of love, the Shroud of Christ. And the fact that it was the custom of artists who made paintings of the shroud, to have their paintings make contact with the shroud suggests the belief that I'm right, that it could transmit a blessing. It transmits a blessing. So if the shroud of Turin is a two-way mirror, a method of communication with the cosmic Christ in the heavenly realms, it's literally a portal or a conduit, right? Yeah. Is the material world and the spiritual world open to each other through the Christ icon of love? Yes. How far can we stretch this? I think we can stretch it pretty far. I mean, like really far. But before we do that, I, I want to just give you further evidence that the face on the Shroud of Turin belongs to Jesus. 
There, and historically, we can show this without a shadow of a doubt. Now, that scientifically, we know exactly that the shroud was present at the time of Jesus. And now historically, through paintings, we can show this as well. In early Christian art, Jesus was not portrayed the way he is on the shroud. He's shown as a young, bearded, beardless man. He's shown as the good shepherd, for example, in the, in the model of the Greek god Helios. Then there's the third and fourth century images of Jesus, beardless, with a magic wand in his hand, performing the miracles. Then there's the fifth and sixth century images that we find, for example, in England, where he's portrayed as Apollo or Helios. But then after the sixth century, all of this changed. What happened? This is when the Shroud of Turin was rediscovered in Edessa in Turkey. After that moment, suddenly, all of the faces of Jesus start to resemble the cosmic Christ. He reappears. It's exactly the same face that we see on the Shroud of Turin. The reason why is because this is the face of Christ. This is the face that is seen on the Shroud of Turin. These artists knew it, and they began duplicating the actual historical face of Christ. And it perfectly matches the Shroud of Turin. Why? Because that's Christ. That is the resurrection shroud of Christ. There's absolutely no doubt about it from an artistic and historical perspective. And now science is saying the same thing. You put the grid pattern over the image of Christ at, at St. Catherine's over the Shroud of Turin, it's a perfect match, absolute perfect match. The only way this is possible is if these artists all suddenly had a simultaneous vision of Christ, or if one of these artists had seen the Shroud of Turin when it was in hiding, and began revealing the original and true face of Christ that appears on the shroud, and now they start duplicating that image. And this is what we see historically. Now we're coming up into the 15th century. It's exactly the same face as what we see in Sinai. This is Simabu, 14th century, same face as on the shroud. Bellini, same face on the shroud. De Messina, Raphael, they all got the memo. This is the face of Christ because Christ is the face that we see on the Shroud of Turin. It's his resurrection shroud, his icon. And what these artists are actually creating for us are additional icons through which we can make eye contact with the cosmic Christ. And isn't that kind of a, a pun on icon, eye con, eye contact, the cosmic Christ. That is the purpose of these images, is for us to see eye to eye so that Jesus can enter into our soul and transmit the Holy Spirit. And of course, this is exactly what Leonardo shows in his famous Christ Panto Crater, a painting that just sold for $453 million on auction in 2017. It's exactly the same face as what we see at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai, and they're both carrying the triple dot symbol of the power of resurrection. He brought that orb with him, uh, in, my, in my view. It's part of what he brought as the, the cosmic star child. So to recap, all of these images are derived from the same source, the Shroud of Turin, the Shroud of Christ, the icon of love, and may even carry the original power of this source. Think about that. Think about the possibilities of Christ as a cosmic being infusing this shroud with his vibration. Do you know the Templars, when they were persecuted, they were arrested by the Catholic Church, they were accused of idol worship because they would take linen strands and place it on an idol, that they would charge those linen strands that would give them power in their earthly life, but also guarantee them safe passage in the afterlife. After torture, at the hands of the Catholic Church, the Templar finally admitted that what they were charging their linen strands on was the Shroud of Turin. They possessed it, and they believed that it could transmit a holy vibration that would protect their physical body and grant them safe passage in the afterlife. This is exactly the same concept as the icons, that these images transmit the vibration of the resurrection or light body, and we can infuse our own light body by studying or contemplating, meditating, and reflecting on the images of Christ, Mary, Padmasambhava, 
any of these other ascended beings that we see in the resurrection body or the light body. I've taken this into ancient Egypt, among the Maya tradition, into the Hawaiian tradition. It's a worldwide tradition that talks about how these ascended beings are rainbow light body beings and how images can assist us in receiving these codes and vibrations. And it's because we are made in the perfect image of God and we have the spiritual capacity to participate in or mirror Christ in his light body. For Buddhists, they talk in terms not of a Christ body, but of our true nature, that this is who we truly are as beings. We're all living a life of samsara, covered over by negative perceptions and false perceptions about who we are as beings. But deep within us is this Christ being, this illuminated being, this glory body, this resurrection body. As we begin to connect with it, we begin to change as people. We become more kind, more compassionate, more giving towards others. As we contemplate, meditate, and reflect on these, we're actually rewiring our brain to make connections to our new selves. This is the principle of neuroscience that I cover, that Claire and I offer in our Art and Science of Living Ascension presentations. In fact, one of those work webinars is available here on portaltoascension.com. And the principle is, is that through contemplation and meditation and reflection on these images, we're literally rewiring our brain to make connections to our new self, to our Christ self. And as your nerve cells fire in response to the images, they're wiring together or weaving together a web of light within your, within your brain, within your spirit and your soul that becomes the canvas for your new body of light, your Christed self. Your brain changes, your body changes, your emotions change. We begin to return to our original state of being, call it the perfect state, our natural state, our Christ state, the blessed state. And as you paint this canvas, you're actually visualizing the actual experience of the light body, and you're fabricating a new life. The images align us with the cosmic Christ, our future selves, our future destiny, and also deeply our true selves, our perfect self. Remember what Jesus said about perfection. I tell you the truth, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling us that our physical flesh and blood body isn't going through the portal, but our rainbow light body will. And in Salvador Dali's incredible painting, The Last Supper, we see Jesus in this interphasic realm. He's part physical, part flesh and blood, but he's exuding this rainbow light, exuding the compassion of the rainbow light body. He's already phasing into it at the Last Supper in anticipation of the crucifixion and the resurrection. A rich man had asked Jesus, what's required for eternal life? And, and Jesus said, follow the commandments. In other words, how do we attain our light body, our Christ body, our resurrection body? And the answer is, we follow the commandments. Love with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest com commandment. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus is telling us the law of compassion is the way to attaining our light body. This is the law of the cosmic Christ. Love with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor is yourself. We are all quantumly entangled. And this is why your neighbor's suffering is your suffering. And until we do something about it, we will all continue to suffer. Well, the rich man had told Jesus that he'd always kept those commandments and he wanted to know what else is required. And Jesus then told him, if thou wilt be perfect, meaning whole, holy, complete, and compassionate, Go and sell what you've got. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. And then you can follow me through the eye of the needle. And I'm not saying for you to go sell your house, your car, quit your job, and go focus on maintaining or attaining your light body. It's probably not a bad idea. But the idea here is that we can become more compassionate. And this is the law of the cosmic Christ. This is the way we will attain our perfection and place ourselves in higher resonance with the cosmic Christ 
and then one day we will follow him. In closing here, I would say that if you seek this robe of light, that the image will show you the way, that acts of compassion and kindness are the acts that weave that robe of light, but ultimately it's the spirit of the cosmic Christ, the Holy Spirit of the cosmic Christ entering into us that will give us the greatest amplitude, if you will, of this spirit, the greatest infusion of this spirit. And in closing, I want to refer you to an image that was painted in, in 1937. It came after St. Faustina's vision of the cosmic Christ appearing to her wearing a white robe and telling her to paint an image according to the pattern you see with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. He attached many promises to those who venerate or love this image. And so upon uh, her request, Mr. Eugene Kesmorowski began the painting of the image in 1934. And in her diary, St. Faustina wrote that Jesus told her, paint an image according to the image, according to the pattern you see with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. I desire that this image be venerated, meaning loved, adored, first in your chapel and then throughout the world, and I promise that the soul that will love this image will not perish. Well, Jesus happens to be using the Abaya Mudra, in which he is, has his palm open, transmitting to you the light that is coming out of his awakened heart chakra. He is transmitting to us the light of the cosmic Christ, the compassion of the cosmic Christ. And he says, I am offering people a vessel with which they are to keep coming for graces to the fountain of mercy, that vessel is this image with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. Our goal, Jesus is saying, is to let God's love flow through this image to our heart and to all those who need it. And in closing, I ask that you let that love and light flow through you, be it through this image, through the icon of love, the shroud of the resurrected Christ, or any of the other images that I have presented to you today as guides for you in your ascension. I'll let those two inspire you to weave your, your cloak of love and light, your cloak of compassion. Wear that as you go forward in these coming days. Imbue yourself and everyone you come into contact with, with that love and light. I want to thank you all very much, the deepest possible gratitude and love and light for being here today. Thank you for all that you've given to Claire and I over these past years, your friendship, your guidance, your, your, your fellowship, your companionship, and especially your compassion. I hope that you will visit my website, williamhenry.net, and keep in touch with us. We have much, much more to share. This is the time where we must rise. This is the time for all future human history where we are making the decisions about how all future humans will live. And if we do our job right, we are laying down a steady base of love, light, and compassion that will see us all through into that future. I want to thank Neil Gar and Portal to Ascension for creating this sacred space for us today. God speak to you all. I love you with all my heart. Thank you so much for being here. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.